A famous experiment revealed how far people will go to achieve what they believe is important. Repetitions of the Milgram experiment show that ordinary people are willing to hurt other people if they are made to believe that their evil actions are necessary for the betterment of society. That is incorrect. This will be at 3.30. The correct phrase is rich boy. When thinking about the best societies in the world, we often think about capitalist democracies. These are usually governments in North America or Europe in which people vote for politicians who will represent them and fight for their interests. But that doesn't always happen. In the US, for example, it is difficult to pass a law which is approved by the majority but opposed by the wealthy. So why do people keep voting for leaders that won't represent them? This is a complicated question. Some people vote for political candidates because they truly believe in their message. Other people simply vote against a candidate that they don't like. In general, however, most people believe we need good leadership. But that belief is part of the problem. Why do we want or need leaders? This is possibly because we believe leaders work for us. It could just be part of our tradition. For thousands of years, most of the world has been run by a small number of people. As more democratic theories were put into practice, ordinary people were given the opportunity to vote for the few people in every country who would make all of the most important decisions regarding national interests. National interests, however, does not necessarily mean public interest. For example, the economy is one measure of a government's success, but again, the economy does not necessarily refer to the public's financial well-being. It refers to the stock market and more specifically the richest people on earth. Governments have a kind of partnership with private corporations. Giant corporations donate to electoral campaigns and can discuss public policy with government officials whenever they want. Governments keep public concerns like climate change far away from private profits. As Adam Smith wrote, the rich are peculiarly attended to. This system of electing a small group of leaders is beneficial to corporate owners because it is easier for them to negotiate with a smaller group compared to the entire population of a country. The U.S. public did not vote for the invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. The public did not vote for the drone assassination program. These drone attacks very often result in failed attempts where innocent people are bombed in public places. And successful drone attacks are no better because they kill people, including Americans, who have not been proven guilty in a court of law. The faith we put on public leaders can have disastrous consequences. I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. We should realize that drone operators are just following orders. Russian soldiers who kill Ukrainian civilians are also just following orders. The problem with institutional hierarchy is obvious, and the solution is not only better leadership, but greater participation in the decision-making process. The idea of democracy is often seen as dangerous. If the majority votes to kill a person, how can we say democracy is good? The fact is that governments and corporations have done a lot of harm by making private decisions. When a corporation like GM decides to move their business to Mexico and fire their US employees, that's a form of institutional hierarchy, not democracy. The argument made by corporations is that since GM is a private company, it has the right to do what it wants with its employees and employees too have every right to leave. Of course, there are rights that individuals deserve, but corporations aren't people and yet they have the same rights as people, actually even more rights than people. One person cannot be in multiple countries at once, but a multinational corporation can. And these companies are not acting alone, that is, completely in private. They use government backing, take advantage of tax rules, enjoy federal contracts, and will gladly take subsidies, loans, and tax-funded high-tech inventions from the public. Still, they insist that the public should not involve itself in the matters of private property. They never entertain the idea that maybe private corporations should not involve themselves 
in public matters. The internet and computers are a prime example. They were created in universities using public taxes. The government allowed private corporations to use the technology for public consumption, but did not take any percentage of private profits. Even 1% would have been a sizable annual income. Today, internet and computer-based companies are wealthier than some countries. Housing, water, electricity, natural gas, oil, food and agriculture, education, and healthcare. All of these things are basic necessities for a dignified life, so they must play a crucial role in public life. Fossil fuels are so ingrained in social life that most people, including conservatives, believe the government should play an active role in keeping access to energy available and cheap. Gas prices are seven bucks in some places in the United States. Here is Joe Biden yesterday talking about how we're moving away from fossil fuels, which, which makes perfect sense. If I went to the store and milk was $10 a gallon, and the president of the United States says, well, you know, we're trying to move you off of milk to rice milk. That's our solution. I might say, well, actually, I would just like the milk cheaper. President Biden tried to pass a bill which included mild but reasonable policies to address climate change by moving toward renewable energy. His party, however, was not completely united and as a result was not able to move forward with such plans. After much negotiation and discussion, two of Biden's fellow Democrats killed the bill. Joe Manchin was the most outspoken critic of the bill. As your senator, I'll protect our Second Amendment rights. That's why the NRA endorsed me. I'll take on Washington and this administration to get the federal government off of our backs and out of our pockets. I'll cut federal spending and I'll repeal the bad parts of Obamacare. I sued EPA and I'll take dead aim at the cap and trade bill because it's bad for West Virginia. During negotiations for the bill, the corporate world, including Trump supporters, got behind Senator Manchin by giving him millions for his 2024 re-election campaign. But Senator Manchin has other motivations. He actually started his own coal brokerage firm. He makes more money from his company than from his job as a senator. Senator Manchin has all the resources of a great leader, lots of money, high-level connections, and an immense amount of power but he prefers to benefit himself and his corporate donors over his party and a large part of the population. He even went against the biggest coal mining union in the US which requested that he reconsider his position. Still, donations from fossil fuel companies seems to have done the trick. Joe Manchin opposed reducing pollution in power plants, opposed helping people buy electric cars, and opposed helping wind and solar energy companies. Republicans were so appreciative of the Democrat that they welcomed him to join the Republican Party. We've got a seat for him. There's a lot of uh, actually good good feelings towards Joe Manchin. I've suggested a good solution to, the, to his problem would be to come across the aisle and join us where he'd be uh, treated with respect. Joe Manchin is only one example found at the highest levels of wealth and power. But the problem of leadership can also be seen at the local level. Medical examiners, for example, have an immense amount of power and sometimes their decisions are purely based on race. A New York Times article mentions a study where 133 pathologists received the same theoretical case in order to see if everyone could make the same forensic conclusion. The study shows that the death of a black child is more commonly labeled as homicide while the identical death of a white child is more commonly labeled as an accident. The study is limited, but there are lots of real-life experiments that scientists can study. Rodriguez Crawford, whose baby died in his sleep of pneumonia, and Rosa Jimenez, who was babysitting a child who accidentally choked, were both convicted of murder. Crawford, a black man from Louisiana, spent three years on death row before being exonerated. Rosa Jimenez, an undocumented woman from Mexico, was given a 99-year sentence but was released after 15 years and handed over to immigration. In both of these cases, they were convicted without any direct evidence against them, and both cases relied heavily on biased autopsies. Medical examiners have a special kind of power. 
they have law enforcement and judges on their side, which means they don't act independently. The Washington Post reported on a study which analyzed the cases of 2,400 exonerated individuals from 1989 to 2019. The study concludes that almost half of all convictions start with flawed scientific conclusions. The other half are due to misconduct by public officials such as police officers and prosecutors who involve themselves in witness tampering, misconduct in interrogations, fabricating evidence, concealing exculpatory evidence, and misconduct at trial. All of these positions of great leadership are highly respected and protected. This is perhaps the greatest problem of leadership. Private and public institutions are not designed for swift punishment or removal of corrupt officials in high positions. In fact, they keep on climbing the ladder of responsibility and respectability. Regarding police qualified immunity, the American Bar Association says, Unfortunately, most members of law enforcement operate today in a culture of near zero accountability. Leadership can be interpreted in many ways, but for the purposes of this video, leaders are defined as people with power, prestige, and security. People who make important decisions that will affect as little as one person, but as many as millions of people. A person like Steve Jobs, for example, is regarded as a genius, an innovator, a tech leader. But he was also not immune to the problems that come along with great leadership, corruption, greed, and power over people. CEOs are under a lot of pressure to constantly grow their company's profits. Steve Jobs went as far as stifling the labor market. He went against free market principles, which he presumably believed in, all because he needed the profits. Computer engineers filed a successful lawsuit which revealed how Apple and other tech companies made secret agreements to not hire each other's employees. Free labor competition was impossible under these agreements. Salaries could be kept lower than they otherwise would be. Wage theft is so common that it is almost an industry in itself. Big corporations can easily steal from low-wage workers and only sometimes pay a fine, but never go to jail. The fines they pay are always less than what they stole. Due to low risk and high reward, wage theft makes economic sense. The media doesn't cover this type of crime on a regular basis, partly because they are not categorized as crimes by the relevant authorities, partly because these same corporations are paying for advertising space, but also because the wealthy are given a romanticized role in society. The caretakers of the world, heroes, the people who move us forward, the images of crime, the type of crime society doesn't tolerate, look very different. More often than not, it is poor people who are seen as the biggest threat. Among the incidents, a Christmas Eve assault on a woman, men armed with baseball bats and a machete. There are also countless suspected drug and prostitution deals. This makes it easy to believe that poor people are responsible for more of the crimes. Liberal Democrats tend to believe crime is a serious problem and it stems from poverty. Conservatives blame other factors such as the increase of single mothers on welfare and irresponsible fathers. But when wealthy leaders who grew up in happy homes get punished, it makes breaking news because we don't see it often and we don't think about powerful and wealthy people as part of the problem of crime. It should be obvious that powerful people can easily take advantage of those with less power and prestige. For example, about 300 people in Harris County, Texas, pleaded guilty to drug possession before the drugs were tested in a lab. Once they were tested, the results were negative and the accused were let go. Pressuring an innocent person to plead guilty because the alternative would be worse is not a crime and lots of innocent people have pleaded guilty out of fear and are still in prison. When we exclude legal state corporate injustices, such as wage theft, racial bias, pollution, war, money and politics, and many others, researchers and intellectuals will see an incomplete picture of crime and its victims, and that can only result in incomplete and sometimes misleading solutions. According to an article in the Harvard Business Review, campaign contributions that influence policy are among those greedy, selfish acts that aren't 
illegal. Until the definition of legal is no longer controlled by the people or organizations with the deepest pockets, it's unlikely that real change will come about. Crime is a very specific word that very often excludes unjust actions by the state corporate complex. In the early 2000s, the big banks knew they were putting together faulty loans and selling them to investors. They knew it was risky, but they did it anyway. And when the entire economy was about to collapse, the government, meaning public taxes, came to their rescue. They did not come to the rescue of millions of homeowners who were kicked out of their homes, but they of course helped the wealthy, respected leaders of society who control the definition of the word legal. The Great Recession of 2008 affected the entire world, but no banker went to jail, except one Egyptian-born executive who admitted guilt. So who is Kareem Sarah Gelden. Many other bankers were able to simply pay a fine because they did not know that what they were doing was a crime. Therefore, it could not be proven that they intended to commit fraud. That's one definition of crime that doesn't quite work for people outside the state corporate world. I found a little bag of meth under your seat. It was in, it was in your possession. It was not in my possession. You didn't get that off of me. All right. The word leadership may need a new definition. A scientist who is a leader in a certain field does not necessarily control the field. Scientific leadership could be seen as influence over other scientists, but it's not the same as control over other people's lives. The word leadership is often commonly seen as a person or people who take charge of a particular project, an industry, or even a whole nation. But is it necessary for a few thousand people to control hundreds of millions of lives? Is it necessary for politicians to control the nation? Is it necessary for a small group of billionaires to control the energy industry and influence government policy? Is it sensible to suggest that when it comes to matters of public life, the public should lead itself? Solving the problems of leadership does not mean we have to subscribe to a rose-colored utopian vision of the world. Not everyone will be an equally good scientist, inventor, musician, philosopher, or athlete. What it means is that we should embed within our culture and our institutions the idea that no one should have unjustified power over others. Communities should be able to make decisions on any public matter, including the public matters which are currently controlled by private leaders.